If you ever wanted isobaric loading explained in a ridiculously in-depth fashion, guess what? Alright, so let's first establish what isobaric loading actually is. If you've ever wired up a pair of voice coils, you know you have some options, namely series and parallel. And just as coils can exhibit different electrical properties depending on how they are wired, drivers can exhibit different electromechanical properties depending on how they are mounted. More often than not, we're used to seeing them in series, like this, with each driver adding to the sum of the cone area. But in parallel, the cone area remains constant, and the individual drivers contribute to the sum of the moving mass, each exerting equal force, or isobar, hence isobaric loading. And there's a few ways to achieve this, as you can see here both drivers can maintain the same polarity, or one of them can be inverted to operate in a push-pull configuration, either as a clamshell or back-to-back. -back. In either instance, the volume of air between the two drivers is acoustically inert, and can be modeled as additional moving mass for that isogroup. Mechanically, there's really no difference between these, unless the driver's suspension allows for more travel in one direction than it does in the other, in which case there's going to be some cross-correction between the two. Now let's talk about what actually happens when we arrange a pair of drivers in series versus parallel, and we'll use this 1200 Series 8 from Audio Dynamics as an example. So here it is, across the middle split down to its essential TS parameters, and you can do this with any woofer. Just to clarify, when multiple drivers share a volume of space, their combined properties can be defined using a single set of TS parameters, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. On the left, we'll look at a pair of those eights mounted in series, and on the right, the same pair of eights mounted in parallel, or isobarically if you prefer. And I'll explain how we arrive at each parameter, line by line, starting with the free air resonance. In both instances, it remains the same. Even though there's twice the moving mass of a single driver, there's also half the suspension compliance. And those same two factors plus the resistive losses keep the mechanical cue intact as well. Moving on to the equivalent air compliance, which accumulates with each additional driver mounted in series, contributing to the piston area that's being acted upon. But when the same compliance is applied to the piston area that's still effectively that of a single driver, as is the case in parallel, the figure is split by the number of woofers in the ISO group. Next, we have the suspension compliance itself, which lowers no matter how we apply the mechanical resistance, so this figure is cut in half whether we impose it in series or in parallel. Moving mass is pretty straightforward. In either instance, there's twice as much of it, so the value doubles regardless of how it's arranged. Likewise, twice the number of soft parts leads to twice the resistive losses, so that doubles for both as well. And this brings us to the piston area. With the woofers mounted in series, there is as much of it as there are drivers, so we double the figure. But in parallel, there is only ever one compound piston, so the value doesn't change even if we were to stack the ISO group 3 or 4 drivers deep. Which, by the way, is a thing, though that's another video. Moving on to the electrical cue. No change for either side. This is a product of free air resonance, moving mass, and suspension compliance, all three of which bear the same relationship to the single driver, whether in series or in parallel. It's also a product of coil resistance and motor force, which I'm getting ready to touch on next. So in the interest of consistency, for this scenario, the two sets of drivers are wired the same way they are mounted, series on the left, parallel on the right. That being said, the electrical resistance doubles in series and is cut in half in parallel, and the same follows for the inductance. Now then, the BL product is a little more tricky. It doubles with the coils wired in series because the current travels twice the length, that's the L. It also remains the same no matter how many coils we stack in parallel, however, this is not the actual motor force figure. To normalize for the difference in load, we square the BL product and divide by the resistance, so as you can see, the actual motor force coefficient in both cases is exactly twice that of a single driver. The total Q is no different from its electrical or its mechanical factor, both of which remain constant and so does their composite. Finally, we arrive at the sensitivity figure. Twice the piston area for the series group doubles the acoustic energy being radiated, which on a logarithmic scale equates to plus 3 decibels. In parallel, we still have the resistive losses of two drivers, but at half the piston area, hence minus 3 decibels. And there it is, you're looking at a complete set of parameters that define a pair of woofers mounted in series and in parallel. If you were to physically arrange them like that and connect a woofer tester, you'd arrive at pretty much the same thing. Now let's talk about how these loading strategies perform when coupled to a chamber. We already have some figures to work with, so let's use them in a scenario. Here's a 10 liter sealed box for each of the loading arrangements. A single driver, as our control represented in white, a pair of drivers mounted in series represented in orange, and a pair of drivers mounted in parallel represented in green. 
For the benefit of consistency across all three, the same voltage is being fed to each. And right away we can see two very distinct deviations from our single driver control. As expected, when we double the piston area with the drivers mounted in series, we gain upwards of 3 decibels along the peak. However, as a group, the two drivers behave like they're in half the space of a single driver which limits the piston travel and with it the low frequency extension. In fact, if we were to double the enclosure space for the series group, it would match the response of a single driver in its original space. Now let's have a look at the isobaric pair. Immediately, you'll notice that there is no gain along the peak since the effective piston area is still that of a single driver. However, as a group, the two drivers behave like they're in twice the space of a single driver, extending the low frequency performance as though each had its own 10 liter chamber. What's more, we can replicate the performance of a single driver in half the physical space. This makes isobaric loading especially useful anytime the air volume for a single driver is on the verge of being insufficient. Other benefits include twice the power handling of a single driver, lower group delay, and the cross-correction of any linearity issue that's specific to either of the two drivers within the ISO group. As a final bit of knowledge, isobaric loading can also be applied to non-resonant enclosures, like transmission lines, allowing them to operate at half the cross-section otherwise needed by a single driver. This can be especially elegant with tapped waveguides, as long as the mounting depth of the drivers doesn't exceed the internal clearance. Anyhow, that just about does it for this presentation. Big thanks to the guys over at the 12V Talk video podcast for plugging my channel in their latest episode, which I'll link to down below. Thank you for watching, thumbs up for more, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. I should be drinking when I do that, shouldn't I? Cheers.